tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Making such a irresponsible comment is totally unacceptable. A controversial Vancouver radio host suddenly resigns after comments about the violent protests in Hong Kong. Also, an accused child killer grilled over his testimony about events leading up to his daughter's deaths and... My brain doesn't block out background noises like other people's brains do. Surrey brings in the experts to help people with autism. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. A controversial host on one of BC's most listened to Chinese radio stations has suddenly resigned. It comes after comments Dr. Thomas Leung made about the Hong Kong protests. What he said on the air sparked widespread outrage. And as our Leung Young reports tonight, some listeners are demanding the station publicly apologize. It was one of the most shocking scenes of violence. Hong Kong protesters in black shirts heading home at Yunlong subway station, repeatedly beaten by a mob dressed in white, with law enforcement nowhere in sight. Police sources later saying some of the white-shirted men had ties to triads and organized crime. That attack, a flashpoint again a month later, leading to the resignation of popular Fairchild radio talk show host Thomas Leung. His opinion? Hong Kong protesters were not without blame, led by a pro-democracy lawmaker who was injured in the attack. Opinions he shared on the radio. Those words generated a wave of backlash, with thousands of comments and social media shares demanding Leung's firing and a campaign to file complaints to the Canadian Broadcast Standards Council. So many, in fact, it exceeded the webpage's technical processing capacities. For Mr. Leung, being a uh, radio host, you know, in Canada, making such a irresponsible comment is totally unacceptable. This former Hong Kong pro-democracy lawmaker who now calls Vancouver home is among those upset. He believes Leung's analysis did little to serve the public. To make such observation and conclusion, in reality, he, he was serving the Chinese government, not serving the Canadian community. He wants an apology from Leung and Fairchild Radio. The station released a statement on Friday saying Leung had resigned for personal reasons. Neither the station nor Leung were available for an interview, but Leung did clarify his position on his Facebook page, saying his program is opinion-based, making it commentary and not news. After watching coverage of the July 21st incident, he says he exercised his freedom of speech to express a different opinion. And if Hong Kong's legal system finds police and gangsters colluded with each other and protesters didn't provoke the violence, then he would apologize. Leanne Young, CBC News, Vancouver. In Hong Kong, the protests reached a new level of violence this weekend. Some police officers drew their guns as protesters chased them with sticks and canes. As the CBC's Chris Brown reports tonight, from there, the situation escalated even further. Hong Kong streets turned white again as tear gas that burns the skin coated protesters who refused to take down street barricades. When that didn't work, police rolled out new weapons. Water cannons mounted on armored vehicles. All of that ratcheted up the intensity of the violence here, but... What we saw on a side street in Kowloon was arguably worse. Riot police confronted what they thought was a small group of protesters. But suddenly from around a corner, more people showed up and went on the attack. In the rain-soaked streets amongst the chaos, one cop stumbled and fell, and for an instant, it seemed he might be swarmed and beaten. Then, in one of the few times since these protests started, police drew their guns. One fired a warning shot. Others waved their guns at the crowd, including in our direction, as one brave man tried to de-escalate things. And this is where that very scary scene ended. 
with the riot police taking shelter in this building here. A few minutes later, as you can see, dozens, perhaps scores of reinforcements came banging on their shields to relieve them, but a very scary moment. People here have given up counting the number of rounds of tear gas that have been fired and the number of nights of clashes between police and protesters. Authorities have tried shutting down metro stations so people can't get to the protests. And Chinese regulators have put pressure on Hong Kong companies to ensure their employees stay away, but none of that appears to be working. After a short lull in the violence last week, Sunday night's confrontations were arguably among the worst since Hong Kong's political crisis began. Chris Brown, CBC News, Hong Kong. In B.C. Supreme Court, Crown prosecutors spent another day grilling accused child killer Andrew Barry. He's on trial for second-degree murder in the deaths of his daughters, six-year-old Chloe and four-year-old Aubrey. As Andrea Ross reports tonight, the Crown focused on Barry's version of events leading up to the girls' deaths. In the months leading up to the Christmas Day deaths of his girls in 2017, Andrew Barry says he was struggling. He testified he owed $25,000 to a loan shark, had his power cut off, and attempted suicide in November. Barry says that as part of a deal to pay back his gambling debt, he agreed to store bags of drugs in his apartment in the months before the murders. He told the court two men dropped off those bags and he was scared of them. But even though he says his daughters were in the apartment watching a movie as the men walked in, Barry says he wasn't worried for their safety. Barry testified that in the summer of 2017, after again failing to meet a deadline to repay the loan shark, he gave a set of spare keys to his associates. When Crown Prosecutor Patrick Weir asked whether he considered how this would affect the safety of his girls, he said, I'm just not that bright. I thought it was easy and it would be over. This is his fourth day on the stand, and Crown prosecutors grilled him for details on his version of events leading up to the girls' deaths. Barry sometimes struggled to answer questions, saying he couldn't remember details of conversations and dates. At times, Crown Patrick Weir suggested he was making things up, including the loan shark and his henchmen. Weir also suggested Barry made up the story of the suicide attempt in November as a way to explain a suicide note found after the girls were killed a month later. Barry denied this. The Crown contends Barry killed his daughters on Christmas morning in 2017 before he tried to take his own life. Barry says his family was attacked by a man with dark skin and hair. He has pleaded not guilty to second degree murder. Andrea Ross, CBC News, Vancouver. RCMP on Vancouver Island believe the bodies found inside a crashed car are those of a missing Sydney couple. Aisha Rael and James Evans were reported missing more than two weeks ago. This past weekend, a passerby discovered a crashed car in a steep ditch off the highway in North Saanich. How do you say it looks like the pair died from an apparent motor vehicle accident, adding it's hard to tell how long the car had been in the ditch. There's quite a bit of overgrowth and forest and trees, and, st and which prevented anyone from seeing it as they drove past. Investigators are now working with the BC Coroner Service to confirm the identities of the pair. More people have moved out of a homeless camp in Vancouver's Oppenheimer Park after a park board order shutting down the tent city. The city says 127 people living there have now accepted housing offers, almost all of the units that were available. But there are still people living in the park. City staff say they will be offering them spaces at local shelters. The deadline to remove tents from Oppenheimer Park passed last Wednesday, but the park board says it is not seeking an injunction to enforce the order. A Vancouver judge has sentenced six men convicted in a 2016 East Vancouver double homicide. Elwood Bradbury, Gopal Figueredo, Shamil Ali and Matthew Stewart were given 18 years for kidnapping and manslaughter of Samantha Lay and Schwan Van Vibakau. The two other men were given less than 15 years, all sentences to be served concurrently. The men were convicted in connection with a pair of execution-style killings. The victims were shot for accidentally interrupting a kidnapping in September 2016. They were killed in front of Bacow's four-year-old son. Coquitlam Search and Rescue were called in to helicopter out a man and his injured dog who were hiking near Bunsen Lake. 
This is the moment, the morning, this morning rather, that Mike Nidzeski and his Bernese Mountain Dog Hunter made it out safely. Earlier in the day, they were on the Dilly Dally Trail. Hunter slipped and fell backward, winding up in a ravine with an injured shoulder. His owner tried to carry the 113-pound pooch and strained his back, stranding the pair in the woods. Search and rescue found the pair early this morning, but waited until daylight to bring in the chopper. Well, it's the last week of summer before school starts, and it's shaping up to be a hot one for us on the south coast. Temperatures are expected to be several degrees above normal. The CBC's Tina Lovegreen hit the beach to see what's sizzling. In the midst of the sunbathers, the cyclists, and the tourists, one thing is a staple in English Bay. It's great. Absolutely it's great. Mike Orbani has been grilling up hot dogs here for 20 years. And how are you doing? Yeah, they just know us. Oh, he wants hot dog. <laughs> that, that's, yeah, that means put me a hot dog. Oh, yeah. He's as much of a destination as the beach. Well, it's the hot dogs. I mean, always. He's the only vendor that I, that I ever buy from. They're, he cuts them a special way. They're consistently delicious. And the summer has been good for business. It's different. For last few summers, we had lots of fire, smoke, and uh, not so pleasant. But this year has been great. We had a combination of rain and uh, sun, and it's been great so far. And look at it. The end is very good right now. Next two weeks is all sun, which is good memory. And with a week left before school starts, his 13-year-old son, Arya, isn't too excited to go back to school. He's not happy. We are, we are happy. No, he's not happy. he got to go to school. And customers aren't ready to see the summer wind down either. No, we need the summer. I like the sunshine. Hot, this guy doesn't come out in the rain. So you have to come down when it's nice and sunny. A little breezy today, but still good. But the last week of August is shaping up to be a hot one for southern BC. Temperatures are expected to be four to seven degrees above normal. Excellent. Beach time. <laughs> so go ahead. Enjoy the sunshine. You got to let it loose and say, what the heck, you know? <laughs> and maybe even a hot dog. It's better than I expected it. Because before you know it... Kids go to school. They, uh, the tourists go back to back home. The business slowly slow down big. And my summer start, basically. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. Okay, Brad, a couple of things there. First of all, I'm hankering for a hot dog. Yeah, uh, and me too. <laughs> wow, what, uh, I mean, this is stunning. I, on Saturday, people are saying, oh, well, summer's almost over. Right. We got another month left of summer. I know, at least by the calendar. Yes. And I know that notoriously people think that the last week of August is just a write off, but no, this one is one where you should be going outside. Get yourself a hot dog, go down to the beach. It is lovely. And even right now, not a cloud in the sky. Temperatures I wanted to show you in the lower mainland, ranging anywhere from about 21 down at the airport to about 24 in West Van, and even warmer as we get into the Fraser Valley. And I'm not really sure if you're prepped for this, but we might actually be able to break a record in terms of temperatures for tomorrow. It is impressive. We're at the end of the month, but it's still going to be quite hot. Overnight low temperatures I wanted to show you are going to be going down to about 14 degrees, largely a little bit cooler over toward New West and Surrey. But in the downtown core, 14, 15 is where we should be. But take a look at this map. Take a nice long look. Those temperatures into the mid to upper 20s. I wouldn't be surprised to see Vancouver get up to 26 degrees. Love it. Thanks, Brett. Talk to you again in a bit. Sounds good. Well, the federal government is investing $500,000 to develop a museum experience in Vancouver's Chinatown. The center will provide a gathering place where visitors can learn about the contribution of Chinatown and Chinese Canadians to the development of Vancouver and be inspired by the fortitude of Chinese Canadians and their role in building a united and diverse nation. Vancouver's Chinatown Foundation will retrofit space at 168 East Pender into a 4,000 square foot storytelling center. The focus will be on highlighting the Chinese Canadian immigrant experience. It's one of 46 cultural infrastructure projects across BC that the government is investing a combined $4.4 million into as part of its cultural spaces fund. Well, if you got some business at Vancouver City Hall, be prepared to pay for your visit. Yes, pay parking takes effect there next week. Starting September 3rd, visitors will have to pay $2 an hour to park. Parking will be limited to two hours on weekdays from 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Parking meters will be installed before the start date 
EZ Park enforcing the new regulations. The city says the current two hours of free parking has been difficult to enforce, with visitors having a hard time finding a parking space. Well, just a reminder, you can watch this newscast and other CBC content wherever you go by downloading the free CBC GEM app. And CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. You can follow us on all platforms for extra content you won't see on TV. Well, no joint communique, no Donald Trump at a meeting on climate change. Coming up, what the G7 leaders did agree to at their summit in France. Okay, so for those of you watching online and Facebook and YouTube, some bonus coverage while we're in the television commercial break. British Columbia is full of so many talented musicians and skilled craftsmen. It's inevitable that those two creative worlds collide. CBC Radio's North by Northwest series, Inside the Craft, explores the relationship between musicians and their instruments. In this episode, master mandolin player John Reichman compares his Gibson with a Michael Haydn mandolin. I'd love to actually have a comparison. Could you play, just so we can hear the difference between sure. these two instruments, could you just play a couple of chords or something on each? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh So that's just, um, I'm fretting the A note on the D string and then playing the open A and the E, so it's... And then I'll do the same thing here. So that's on the Haydn. That's the Haydn, and here's the Gibson. The Haydn's more in tune at the moment, but... I, but I, totally, I don't hear a lot of difference. Well, it's, I'm using the same pick. Okay. That which you know has a lot to do with it. You know, using a pick that's I like one that's that's thick enough, but not too thick. If it's too thick, I can't play as fast as I'm can can play. Not that it's all about speed, but it's good to have that. You know. Why is that? It's less resistance, I guess. Okay. Um, and then I like the rounded edge. But uh, well, let me see. There's the Gibson. Do you hear a big difference? I do. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, not huge, but th that, that more complex uh, tonal quality in the Haydn is more obvious to me, especially on the A string. It's sort of a thicker sound, and this one is slightly um, more clear. So they both sound really good. Yeah, I could hear so a little bit of difference in that time, but... So, to my ear, it's very subtle. Yeah. Well, I think it's because it's the same guy playing it. Right. So I'm trying to get... It's not the car, it's the driver. <laughs> you could say that. <laughs> Somebody did. Yes. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, I'm trying to get a similar tone right. out of all instruments, pretty much. Very cool. And you can tune in to watch that full series on our YouTube channel, CBC Vancouver. And we'll be back in just a few moments with more news. Stay with us. The G7 summit began in France under a cloud of uncertainty. There were a lot of Handshakes and carefully exchanged words. French President Emmanuel Macron declaring from the get-go world leaders would not reach a joint communique. That, however, didn't impede all progress on a range of issues. The CBC's David Cochran has more. Thanks very much for being here for this, uh, this session on uh, climate and biodiversity. The G7 has just months to advance a progressive agenda focused on issues such as climate change and gender equality. We are short in time and we have a lot of things to do. Short of time because at the end of this year, there's another handoff. The United States assumes leadership of the G7 and the priorities will change. There was tremendous unity. There was great unity. Uh, sometimes I'd read a little bit of 
false reporting. I just wanted to say that we worked together uh, hand in hand uh, with President Trump. Kind words, but Trump's imprint on this summit was sizable. The normally long and expansive unanimous end of summit communique reduced to a single page summary. Leaders did agree to work towards the creation of an international tax for tech companies who find ways to avoid taxes. And in addition to taxing Amazon, they promised to help save the Amazon. A consensus on climate change was impossible. Trump notably skipped the climate and biodiversity session at this summit to hold one-on-one -on -one meetings with other leaders instead. And while leaders pressed him to dial down his trade war with China, Trump seemed less interested in settling than winning. China wants to make a deal. Now, whether or not we make a deal, it's got to be a great deal for us. Trade uncertainty causes economic anxiety, an issue Justin Trudeau says he raised at the summit. Around the world, hardworking, middle-class people are already having a, time, having a hard time making ends meet. A topic for discussion here, an issue in the coming election at home. Trudeau used a global summit to remind Canadians he would help them out. We in Canada believe that we should put the best balance sheet in the G7 to work for the middle class. If Trudeau wins the election, he will attend next year's Trump-hosted summit as the G7's problem child will become its president, likely bringing world leaders to Miami and the golf resort he owns there. All of it happening in the run-up to the U.S. presidential election. David Cochran, CBC News, Biarritz, France. And those wildfires devastating the Amazon rainforest became a top item at the G7 summit. Leaders pledging some $20 million to fight the flames, with Canada promising an additional $15 million. But as CBC's Helen Morrow reports, Brazil's leader is balking at the foreign help, saying Brazil is being treated like a colony. The Amazon wildfires were a top issue at the G7 for many of the leaders, particularly the summit's host, Emmanuel Macron. As a group, the French president said the G7 would provide at least $20 million to fight the fires that are ravaging the world's largest rainforest, considered the lungs of our planet. The money will be primarily used to pay for more firefighting planes. Canada has also pledged $15 million and the use of water bombers. And our government has been in touch with the Brazilian government to offer our support and to put an end to this crisis. But the G7 help was not readily welcomed by Brazil's leader, Jair Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro accused France of violating Brazil's sovereignty, saying Macron is treating Brazil as if it were a colony or no man's land. Protests have broken out in front of Brazilian embassies across the world in anger at Bolsonaro's government. Critics accusing it of essentially creating an environment allowing the mass fires to happen through his anti-environmental rhetoric and lack of action on deforestation. Brazil has involved the military in the fight, saying that 44,000 troops are available to battle the flames. The scale of the devastation is hard to imagine. More than 75,000 fires have been reported in the Amazon since the beginning of the year. And now the frantic effort to stop the fires and save one of the world's most precious ecosystems continues on the ground. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. Well, the city of Surrey has called in the experts. Coming up, how two young people are helping others with autism.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. For Mr. Leung, being a uh, radio host, you know, in Canada, making such a irresponsible comment is totally unacceptable. A controversial Vancouver radio host suddenly resigns after comments he made on air about the violent protests in Hong Kong. Also accused child killer Andrew Berry is grilled over his testimony about events leading up to his daughter's deaths, including a spare set of keys to his apartment he says he gave to two men. While growing up with autism can be hard, and a pair of young people from Surrey know that as well as anyone. As Jesse Johnston reports, that's why they're trying to make it easier for an entire city. Sylvain Formo would have loved this canvas castle when he was a kid. It's quiet, it, I, kind of like I'm on my own. I would have liked being kind of on my own in some way. That would have made me feel more comfortable, like just a place to relax. Those words, comfortable and relax, are important in this space at the Museum of Surrey. Their feelings that Kayla Tellier finds in this beanbag pillow. They feel really comforting and warm when you're in them, but also the noise of the beans inside can be a very comforting sound for a lot of people. Formo and Tellier are both experts in relaxation because they both know all too well. It's a hard one. <laughs> um, what it's like to feel overwhelmed. It's just um, because my brain doesn't block out background noises like other people's brains do. So when I'm in a crowded space, it tries to process all the conversations happening around me, which also makes it hard for me to talk to the people that I'm with. And then it gets really confusing, and then it gets really scary. The feeling she describes is common for people with autism, which is why the city is hiring Tellier and Formo to create sensory-friendly spaces, like this one at the Surrey Museum. It's a citywide priority, and now even the fire department is working on becoming sensory-friendly. I, I had to learn quickly about autism. All firefighters are taking awareness training, and soon trucks will be equipped with these special kits to make sure people with autism are comfortable. Uh, noise cancelling headphones. When crews respond to calls. All of the frontline apparatus will have sensory friendly devices and then uh, picture symbol communication cards. Wilson knows better than most how much of a difference these kits can make because his young daughter has autism. My daughter's changed my perspective on life, my perspective on people, uh, as a result of my of learning from her. That's Surrey's new approach, learning about autism from people with autism. The teachers are young, but their life experience makes them expert instructors. And now, their classroom is an entire city. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, Surrey. That's a nice live shot of the sun reflecting off Science World at 6.30 on this Monday evening. Another stunning day on the south coast. Could it possibly last all week? Brett's forecast is next.
Okay, Victoria is now a top contender to host the 2022 Invictus Games. Politicians and supporters came together to support the city's bid in Victoria. The Games are a multinational sporting event for injured servicemen and women. Invictus Foundation has been touring the region's sports venues and assessing the Victoria bid. The city is competing against Dusseldorf, Germany. Being injured or ill or disabled doesn't mean that I'm broken, which is a term commonly used in the Canadian Armed Forces. In fact, it means that I'm resilient beyond belief. And the decision will be announced in the fall. The last time the Invictus Games took place in Canada was 2017 in Toronto. Brett is here now. We have some breaking news. Yep. There's snow in downtown Vancouver. Yeah, I, I, we're not lying. It, it's actually <laughs> happening. And uh, no, this isn't some freak of nature. We want to see what we're talking about here. Yeah, this is a live look right now, just outside of our studio. This is in right in the vicinity of the Queen Elizabeth Theatre, and it appears as though there is some form of a movie shoot. Might be a commercial, mm -hmm. we're not sure, but there is a very festive theme going on. And if you can see it, yeah, that is some white. That is white snow yeah, they were in Vancouver. It in. They trucked it in this afternoon. I'm seeing seriously pretty impressed by that. Um, I don't think that, uh, for the sake of argument, I don't think it's going to be around for too much longer. <laughs> Temperatures right now are really not going to be conducive to snow. I mean, rarely is it ever super conducive to snow here in Vancouver, but especially not the last week in August. All right. Precipitation-wise, what can we expect? Well, for the south port of our province, not a lot. All of the rain that we're going to be dealing with is far to the north. Over the next little while, we've just got some showers for Haida Gwaii, the north and central coast. But watch this. We get midweek. This is Wednesday. And there's no rain to be found across the entire province. We've got a really nice ridge in the jet stream building. That means it is going to be dry. And that means we are looking at sunny skies for the most part and temperatures that are really going to be well above seasonal. Wanted to take a peek at those temperatures right here. You're going to see this. This may say Tuesday at August 27th, but Port Alberni, 31. The soy is 32, but Abbotsford, 29. I mean, that is definitely closer to what we would be seeing at the end of July. Same story, roughly, for the time that we get around to Wednesday. We're going to be looking at temperatures that are quite comfortable and in the end this actually could potentially break that record. I was mentioning that at Vancouver 27.2 would be the record set in 1967 and we are calling for 26 degrees by the time that we get to tomorrow. What are we looking at for our five-day forecast? Well I did mention lots of sunshine in the forecast. Highs of around 26 and then 25 again on Wednesday. Thursday, Friday, Saturday that's when a few clouds are going to come back but uh, I think for the last week before September that's a pretty great way to end it wouldn't you say? Very nice indeed. Very comfortable. <laughs> we'll take it. Absolutely. Even take the snow over there on the yeah, line. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. All right. Well, it was uh, destined for demolition, but an historic floating cabin that was once home to workers and squatters on the North Shore has found a new home. And as Andrea Ross reports, the blue cabin has been transformed into an artist sanctuary. This little blue cabin holds decades of fond memories for Carol Itter. I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Itter moved into the cabin on the shores of North Vancouver in the 1970s with her partner, musician and artist Al Neal. Built in 1927, the cabin had no running water. It was a simple life. Uh, it was tucked into a bay and almost nobody could see it, which is how we wanted it. Yeah. Now it's where other artists will find inspiration. It served us well. It was a, an incredible place to be, and that it's back on the water and under open skies and near uh, magnificent trees and all these amazing glass buildings, it's astounding. The cabin was historically home to barge workers and eventually squatters. It was ordered removed by a developer in 2015 and put into storage. Over a million dollars was raised to move the cabin, build a residency, and operate it for three years in False Creek. Its inaugural program focusing on Coast Salish weaving practices. We just kind of wanted something that would kind of uh, speak to its cultural life that it had and maybe have a new cultural life going forward. Squamish Nation artists like Janice George and Buddy Joseph will take up residency here over the next year, sharing Indigenous language, stories and ceremony through weaving. We learn about it, we learn the techniques, yes, but we learn all of the, the spiritual and uh, energetic things that go with it. And I think 
It encourages people to look at their own culture. Australian Indigenous artist and activist Vicky Cousins will be the first international artist in residence. She is expected to move in next month. Andrea Ross, CBC News, Vancouver. Catchy slogans and pointed attacks. Federal election ads are coming. What you can expect from our politicians next. Yeah, it's really relevant here in Metro Vancouver. I'm calling from CBC Vancouver News. There are so many stories in this city to tell and to explore. Are you available for an interview? Our listeners deserve an explanation. This. That's just anecdotal. It's really the perfect place to live. The fact that people come from all over and want to make a home here, that says a lot about the city. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Join CBC Vancouver's Leanne Young at Feast of Fields on September 8th. Get your tickets today to this gourmet harvest festival. And CBC Vancouver is a proud sponsor of Literacy Month. Through small actions in our everyday lives, we can all play a part in improving literacy skills in BC. Learn what you can do to help at dakota.ca. And for more info, you can check us out online. The federal election is now less than two months away, and the parties are starting to roll out their campaign battle cries, simple slogans to brand their party and try to capture the attention of voters. Katie Simpson looks at the meaning behind the messages. Why do the rich keep on getting richer and the rest of us keep falling behind? I have a plan to lower the cost of living, to make life more affordable. Here come the direct appeals for your vote. Election ads are popping up everywhere, delivering simple slogans party leaders hope will sway the campaign in their favor. I am for moving forward for everyone. Choose Forward is the core Liberal re-election message, and it says a lot about the party's fear of a progressive vote split. 
Liberals need to make the election a choice between them and the Conservatives, period. They need to reduce the comfort zone for people to vote NDP or Green. Justin Trudeau argues he's the only one who can beat the Conservatives and to give that message some urgency. He's trying to lump Andrew Scheer in with unpopular Tories. We've got a choice to make. Keep moving forward and build on the progress we've made or go back to the politics of the Harper years. The Conservatives are playing into a different kind of anxiety, one felt by influential suburban voters who can't keep up with the cost of living. Because it's time for you to get ahead. Scheer's slogan makes the case it's Trudeau's friends that are getting ahead, including major corporations such as SNC-Lavalin. It's not about grandiose promises. This is something very specific. You know, if you vote Conservative, you're going to get ahead. The official NDP slogan is due out after Labor Day, but online ads paint leader Jugmeet Singh as a traditional champion of the working class. As governments in Ottawa have been working for them, not us. Political slogans often work best when they're short and simple. Make America great again. But finding a phrase that will stick comes with risk. I don't think a slogan itself can make or break a campaign, but if you get the slogan wrong, it speaks about so many other faults in your campaign because these things are the embodiment of a, a really of a modern campaign. The only way to get a slogan to stick is through repetition. Canadians will be bombarded by ads after Labor Day. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. The leader of the People's Party of Canada is pushing back against criticism of a billboard campaign that supports the PPC's immigration policy. The signs, as you can see, call on voters to say no to mass immigration. They are now being removed right across the country following widespread criticism. This billboard below the Knight Street Bridge was replaced early this morning. The advertising group behind the billboards is now distancing itself from the message in a statement. True North Strong and Free Advertising Corporation Company says it never signed off on the controversial campaign. For his part, People's Party leader Maxime Bernier tweeted, the message on the billboard is not controversial for two-thirds of Canadians who agree with it and for those who disagree but support free speech and an open discussion. It's only controversial for the totalitarian leftist mob who want to censor it. A Canadian has been killed in Mexico. 62-year-old Daniel Lavois, originally from Quebec, was living in retirement in Cancun. He was at one time an honorary Canadian consul to Mexico. Local media reports say Lavois's body was discovered by a friend who hadn't been able to reach him for some time. Mexican authorities say there were definite signs of violence, but they're not discussing any possible motive. Global Affairs Canada says it is providing consular services to Lavois's family, but has not provided any details, citing privacy rules. Well, it was a hate crime that rattled a Winnipeg neighborhood until police charged the victims with allegedly faking the whole thing. But now court documents obtained by CBC News reveal how investigators reached that conclusion. The CBC's Caroline Berguth explains how traffic cameras came into play. In the spring, when Oksana Barrett invited us into her restaurant, it was the first time she and her son Maxim had been inside Bear Max Cafe and Bistro. Since the night, she said she'd been attacked and left unconscious on the floor. Her business was trashed and spray-painted with anti-Semitic graffiti. She told her story to CBC Radio at the time. And the next what I remember, it, it just, when I was, it, I was, I, I'm sorry, I was, I was in it, in it, in it. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was in it fabulous. Within hours, there was an outpouring of public support and even a GoFundMe page had been set up. Days later, Winnipeg police said the victims had staged the hate crime. In recently released search warrants, police say the Barron story just didn't add up. Maxim had told investigators he and his father, Alexander, had gone to Home Depot the night his mother's business was vandalized. But police say in court documents, CCTV cameras on traffic lights captured Alexander in the family's Cadillac and no one in the passenger seat. And only Alexander was spotted going in and leaving Home Depot, despite Maxim maintaining he was there too. Security expert Michael Laguerre says what people need to realize is that police can get access to traffic cameras and cell phone transmission records to find out where a person has been. 
to lie about where you are in public nowadays is getting increasingly difficult. Uh, the number of sources of truth uh, that are out there can e easily show that uh, you know, what you stated uh, was not what happened. The search warrants say the restaurant had two cameras, but they weren't set up to record. However, the security system logged every time a door opened or closed and each sound of breaking glass. And no one came and left during the time the Barrents say they were targeted. Investigators wrote they believe Maxim stayed at the restaurant and staged the robbery and hate crime with his mother. None of the allegations against the Barrents have been proven. Their next court appearance is scheduled for October. Caroline Bargut, CBC News, Winnipeg. E-cigarette use or vaping is on the rise, especially among young people. And there is growing concern about the role advertising is playing. A U.S. study has found that adolescents who see e-cigarette ads are twice as likely to start vaping. As Cass Rusi reports, some experts say it all sounds disturbingly familiar. We're talking state-of-the-art design in a pocket-sized fit. The ads are pervasive and slick, so no surprise that vaping marketing of e-cigarettes in stores has helped make them the most popular tobacco products among teens and young adults. There's so many like ads like nowadays for like vaping and yeah, like and I alternative feel like, stuff. And I, feel like, like, I feel like it's a little bit unnecessary. And kids are like getting into it too easily and like they're seeing the ad and then it's attracting them. These are companies that maintain they are not interested in recruiting youth. Um, having said that, so long as those ads remain in the stores, remain next to the candy and the slurpy machine, I think it's difficult to take that uh, claim seriously. Today's study shows those ads are having a dramatic effect. The fact that seeing promotional messages in stores increases the likelihood of future vaping, that's pretty much the exact same road that we went down for cigarettes and tobacco many years ago. Tobacco ads are banned in Canada and the U.S., but the rules are a lot looser for e-cigarette advertising. Researchers in this study say the unregulated e-cigarette market has contributed to its growing popularity, especially among young adults. You are in the work. A development this researcher saw coming. We did warn the government, and we said, you know, if you allow advertising, then you're going to get a lot of uptake, uh, and, that, and you're not looking for that. Schwartz is currently involved with a similar research in Canada that shows that after one year, 40% of youth and young adults who weren't vaping picked up the habit. I would say that this is urgent, given the numbers uh, of young people who are starting to vape, and they're becoming addicted. Health Canada says it intends to introduce new measures to curb the rise in vaping by young people, some of which include more ad restrictions and limits on the display of vaping products in stores. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Toronto. Well, a new kind of laboratory is taking to the seas and the skies in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. It's a research vessel that's trying to learn more about the habits of the North Atlantic right whale. Eight of the endangered animals have died in Canadian waters this year alone. And as Gabrielle Fami explains, scientists hope using new technology to get up close and personal with them will help figure out why. This drone goes where no scientist can, hovering over a surfacing right whale's blowhole, capturing samples of wet breath, and yes, whale snot. It's a fun little system, it's really quick, and uh, we were glad we had a, a drone racing pilot to, to, to pilot that one for us. It's, a, it's a, quite a task getting that over the web. The drone returns with its precious cargo, where eager scientists will pour over its contents for clues about the whale's health. And we're hopefully looking at uh, cortisol, um, testosterone, progesterone. Anything that will help researchers understand what's happening to these endangered animals. Eight right whales have been found dead this season, floating in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, where they've been chasing their main food source on the move north in pursuit of colder waters and more bountiful prey. Finding a meal is getting increasingly difficult. Stress in humans causes a lack of fertility. It's likely to be the same in the whales. So by exploring how stressed the whales are related to perhaps ship noise or reduced prey in the environment, we can assess their um, potential for uh, recovering. Scientists spotted seven whale calves earlier this season. A good sign, but not enough to keep the species from extinction. 
Stress from human interference may be a key factor. When the world ground to a halt during the September 11th terror attacks, there were fewer ships moving about, and red whales appeared healthier. Ships create a lot of noise that sort of floods the Atlantic Basin, and when that went down, the stress levels in the whales also went down. That's the point of this mission, to assess the role human activity may be having on this dwindling population. All of that information, we can take that and give it to the people who have to make decisions and develop the policies for protecting the whales. The drone here um, has two flight batteries. There are reasons to hope. In one remarkable aerial snap during the trip, 10 North Atlantic ride whales swimming next to each other. An incredible sight, but a worrying one too, as slow swimmers that stay close to the surface these whales are particularly vulnerable newcomers to the busy waters of the Gulf. Gabrielle Fami, CBC News, Dalhousie. Friendless on Facebook. That's the goal of a man in Saskatoon. Coming up why he's purposely losing friends one phone call at a time. Hi, I'm Laura Lynch and for Stephen Quinn on the early edition. Tomorrow we're going to take a trip to the Northern Cafe. It's tucked away on top of a building supply store near a wood shop and a seafood supplier. And you'd never find it unless you already knew it was there, but it has survived all these years. I think it's fair to say that the ending of any friendship is never easy. And a Saskatoon man is going through it 550 times. Yep, he's dumping all of his Facebook friends. Wow, but as CBC's Bonnie Allen tells us, he's going to try to let them down easy, not just unclick, but rather call them at the same time. James Avramenko is scrolling down his list of Facebook friends, picking out pals to drop. Basically, my goal is to lose every friend I've ever made on Facebook. 
uh, is kind of the basic idea about it, uh, while still reconnecting with everybody in some meaningful way. <laughs> to do that, he's calling all 550 of his online friends oh, one by yeah, one yeah. for a one-hour oh, so conversation. Cool. I, I then he clicks like unfriend. The 32-year-old Saskatoon writer is concerned Facebook breeds lazy yeah. friends yeah. and yeah. superficial yeah. relationships. Yeah. When we look at someone, we tell ourselves that we've connected to them because we feel a connection to their photo, but that's not, that's not speaking to them, that's not connecting with them, that's not checking in with them. It's purely looking at them and moving on. He records the phone calls for a podcast called Friendless. We are no longer Facebook friends. Oh, my heart. <laughs> He's already broken up with his groomsman, a former boss, and in this episode, a childhood friend who he hadn't spoken to in 20 years. We've been friends for, for you know, 10 years on Facebook, and the first time we messaged was last week. Totally. <laughs> I'm like, and I'm quite embarrassed at how little I know about the trajectory of your life. Professor Alec Koros says there's a growing trend of tech users trying to be more intentional about how they use social media. There's just this exhaustion over time that you're constantly performing for this network. But often there's also a specific trigger. Sometimes you might have some stress or trauma in your life and you realize that while I can put something out there in a the public, I actually have no one to talk to. Avramenko is searching for deeper connections. He expects some of his relationships will flounder and die offline. It gets tough. There's been a couple of conversations that I've really not wanted to end for fear of losing contact again. At this rate, he won't have any friends left in about 10 years. On Facebook, anyway. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. <laughs> Yeah, you did the math too, right? Yeah, I was checking it out. Ten years and I think an extra seven months there to get rid of that extra Deeply committed bit. to ditching his friends. Very. And Here's my question. Mm. Like, you, if you know the guy's doing it, mm -hmm. you're one of his friends, and you're one of the first to go, like, yeah. does that say anything about the relationship? <laughs> I think he's doing it in like, alphabetical order or something. Would there yeah. be, like, an objective way to do it? If I still had Facebook, maybe I could try that. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, know. if you're number 549. Yeah, exactly. 50, you're, you're still, still up there. That's just it. <laughs> all right, that's all the time we have tonight. Uh, Leanne Young is here at 11 o'clock right after the National. Thanks a lot for watching. Good night. Still my friend? Yeah. Okay. Always. <laughs>